300 years old, uh, dating back to the early 1700s. Uh, much of the music that you hear on it uh, can be as many as uh, 800 years old. So that's when a lot of this uh, music began. Uh, if there's a song that was played on the Quora um, before it came around, so before 1700, it was usually composed on an instrument called the balafone, which is a wooden xylophone with one mallet in each hand. Uh, or the ngoni, which is a stringed instrument that gets played sort of like the guitar. Um, with the kora here, uh, down at the very bottom is a calabash, which is a gourd that grows in the ground like a pumpkin. Um, to use it for the kora, they cut it in half, uh, de-seed it, and take out all the wet uh, material that's in there. Uh, they dry it in the sun for two weeks up to a month. Um, and then it gets uh, it ho it's hollowed out, it's dried, uh, and then you have to stretch a wet animal skin over the open half, which gets nailed back here to the back side with upholstery tacks. And then three holes are cut into the calabash once the skin's on, and two of those holes are so that the neck that I'm holding onto, this long piece of wood, can slide through the top down to the bottom. And then the third hole right here uh, it serves two very important roles. Uh, the first is so that sound can come out, and the second is so that money can go in the hole. And the reason that money goes into this hole is because uh, the people who play these instruments historically do a lot of praise singing. Um, sometimes the praise singing is for a particular person. Um, if that's the case, um, if there's like, actually I'm gonna get into it a little bit later, but um, it's, it's really interesting how it all happens. Uh, but I do want to move along with construction of the corner here. So once you have the neck through and the sound hole punched, um, you have this iron ring that has to go through the bottom of the neck. And the easiest way to get that through is just to take a power drill and put a hole through. Most of the core makers that I knew in Gambia didn't own drills. So what they would have to do is they would heat the ring up like in an open fire that was used to cook with, or in like this little aluminum tin that was used to brew a tra traditional tea with called a taya. Uh, so they'd heat the ring up for a few minutes and then put a glove on one hand while they held the ring up against the wood and they would take a hammer with the other hand and start pounding that into the wood. Um, and once they had all they need, they'd slide the ring through and secure it in place. And then they'd put the anchor strings on those are the, the darker ones down here below. I'm actually going to move just a little closer to the camera. So these here are the, the anchor strings. And then the plucking strings get tied off to those. And then they run up to the neck here. And they are met by tuning rings. So each of the strings get tied around one of these tuning rings about four or five times. And then to tune, you actually physically have to move these tuning rings up the neck or down the neck. So by moving them up the neck, you're putting tension on the strings. And so that's going to raise the pitch and uh, vice versa, do it the other way. This bridge here, um, it holds the strings off of the skin. Um, so there's two rows of 11 strings here, being a 22 string core. So 11 on that side and 11 on this side. Um, we have two handlebars. So 
and a crossbar, I should say. So that's a total of six holes that you have to cut into the calabash to get each of those through. So two for the crossbar here, and then two for each of the handlebars. And uh, as, you, as you can probably tell, there's quite a few differences between the two cores that I am using this evening. So this core right here is the model that you would more often than not see uh, if you were to go to um, one of the countries where it's from, such as Gambia, Senegal, or Mali. Um, there's about 10 countries up in Northwest Africa where you can find the four. Um, so the four major differences between the two are the type of animal skin that's used, the wood materials, the string materials, and the tuning system. So this core uses cow skin, um, which is very common in Gambia. In fact, I've never seen anything more than that used to cover the, the open end of the calabash. The wood uh, is called Kano. The strings, I'll put a little bit closer here again. Now, these strings are actually made of fishing line. Uh, so fishing line has been used for about 100 years. Before that, they used antelope pipes, um, like the, the skin of the antelope for the plucking strings. And the tuning rings are actually also made of cowhide, although they are a little bit darker than the, the one that covers the calabash. With this Quora, uh, this one was actually built in the US uh, back in 2011. Um, it uses elk skin. Uh, the person who actually built it, um, he lives in Oregon and runs an elk farm. So uh, he used an elk skin instead of a cow skin, pulls it very well. Um, the wood, there's two kinds. Uh, one is Paduk and the other is Honduras mahogany. And everything has been sanded and uh, finished and stained. Um, and then the strings here, rather than being uh, fishing line, are harp strings. I know it's going to be hard to tell uh, from your angle, but uh, they've been ordered from a harp store. And then the last major difference is the tuning system. So rather than having tuning rings that you have to move up or down the neck, you have tuning pegs that you can twist like a guitar. And uh, that makes it a lot easier to tune. OK. I'm going to play a song called Ninku Bay Kelly. And I learned this one uh, on my most recent trip to Gambia in 2018. It's a traditional song, um, meaning uh, when you meet someone for the very first time, uh, you think very well of them. Ninku Bay Kelly. Come 
teacher's daughter, my teacher being Morba Nyate uh, of Gambia. Uh, his daughter's name is Bintu, and she's probably 13 or 14 now at this point. And she came over and sat next to me as I was rehearsing this song on my most recent trip there uh, to her home. And so uh, she was singing in Mandinka. So the Mandinka people, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the Mandinka people are one of seven ethnic groups in Gambia. And they're primarily the people who play these instruments. So all the singing that I'm doing is in the native Mandinka language. So when Bintu sat next to me, uh, she was singing in Mandinka. And so I brought Morba over and had him translate the words to English as he does for all the songs that he teaches. Uh, so here with Nsumbu, uh, the words that Bintu uh, came up with mean when you're missing one you love, uh, you should be with them. Bamba, 
called Tabara. Uh, this one's named after a woman of Fulani descent, which other than the Mandinka are one of the other six ethnic groups uh, who live in Gambia, one of many other countries in West Africa. Uh, so this song was written in the 1800s while she was still alive, and the song was dedicated to her by the people in the village where she lived. It was unanimously believed that she was the most beautiful woman the village, and people want their be a song written for to borrow. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the people who play these instruments next. Um, so as I mentioned before, they are of the Mandinka ethnic group, but within Mandinka society, there is what some might consider to be a class system that exists. And so uh, oftentimes people are born into families that uh, do certain things for their work uh, throughout the entirety of their lives. And many of these types of work are similar to what we have over here. However, the people who play these instruments, we do not have an equivalent uh, in our culture. These people that I speak of are called griots, spelled G-R-I-O-T-S. And a griot is a historian, uh, literally a walking history book. Um, and all of this history dates back to the founding of the Mandinka Empire in the mid-13th century, 800 years. And it's their cultural responsibility to know some of the more, most important aspects of this history. None of it's written down. Uh, just like this music, none of it's written down. I don't have any sheet music. Um, no one ever has. It's all passed down uh, orally and just kind of embodying um, what, what you are taught. <laughs> um, so the griots, um, they play at a lot of different events. I'm going to talk about some of the events that they, they play at. Uh, there were three main ones that I saw while I was in Gambia. Uh, and they were uh, weddings, naming ceremonies, uh, which occur exactly a week after a child is born, uh, but also informal events inside of their own compound or someone else's compound. And a compound is a, a home where an entire extended family lives. And it wasn't just the griots who lived this way. It was pretty much everyone that I knew. Um, so you'd have between, I would say, seven and 35 people living in a compound. And if it was on the larger end, you would have the griot, the, the, the head of the household, and his, his wife. Uh, all of their children and grandchildren, and each immediate family of, mo of a mom and dad and kids would have a room or two or even three to themselves. And those would be on the exterior walls of the compound, which were concrete walls, uh, like cinder blocks that had been um, uh, cemented together, basically. And so when you came from the street into someone's compound, you'd walk through a, an archway, uh, sometimes having a sliding gate or double doors that open out to the street or into the house. Uh, once you got to the other side of that, you'd look up and you'd see the sky. So you're still outside. You were in the compound, but you're outside. Um, that's usually because you're entering the courtyard. And a lot of these courtyards are fairly sizable. So that's where a lot of this music would take place informally. Uh, often it was rare to see the core presented solo. Uh, like you're seeing this evening, they would usually be accompanied by other instruments, uh, namely the balafone, the wood xylophone that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, go the ngoni, uh, which has six strings. It's only about this long, uh, which is probably two feet, maybe three, 
um, and you play it like a guitar. Um, and but you have other instruments as well, like guitars, uh, electric guitars in some cases, um, uh, acoustic guitar, drums, some native to the region, some not, like the djembe, uh, which is a cow skin headed drum. It's on a wooden um, pear shaped frame. Uh, the two more formal events where I'd see music played out would be weddings and naming ceremonies. So as I mentioned before, naming ceremony happens exactly a week after a child is born. And it's a three-part event where they name the child, uh, have a feast, and then have some music. The naming would take about an hour long, maybe an hour and a half. And uh, that segment would be held in the, the childhood home where the mother of the newborn had grown up. So she may be living with her husband's extended family, but it might be flipped the other way around. Um, there would be a griot on a bullhorn saying praise, uh, wishing well to the newborn and the family. Uh, oftentimes another griot would be right next to him, uh, telling him what to say to the bullhorn because he would be going back and forth between the griot and the bullhorn and the audience, who amongst themselves were discussing name possibilities. And it was a very communal decision. So it was through this relay of information back and forth that the name would be announced or uh, determined, I should say, before it was announced. And then once it was announced, uh, they'd move on to the feast. Food would be served in large bowls that I would say four up to eight people would sit around and share from together. Eating would be done with your right hand, typically. Uh, you could use utensils, which were readily available. I found it easier to use my hand based on how the food was served. So in these large bowls, you would have cooked white rice at the bottom. Um, you would have uh, an assortment of vegetables over the top, all of which would be steamed uh, in a soup pot over an open fire. Uh, some of the main ones would be cabbage, carrots, cassava, which we don't see a lot of here as much, uh, eggplant, leeks, potatoes, onions, things like that. Uh, meat was very common. Uh, chicken and fish were both very common. Uh, occasionally, you'd see beef brought out or goat even, but uh, chicken and fish were definitely the most common, especially fish, because uh, the family that I stayed with was only about a 15 to 20 minute drive from the ocean. So fish was sourced fairly locally um, and purchased in the markets from family members who were out doing the fishing. Uh, so the vegetables would be served in pretty large chunks. So you might have like a quarter of a cabbage just sitting there cooked in your bowl. Um, uh, large chunks of carrots and everything else. With fish, they would actually wrap a whole fish in tin foil and then cook it on the fire. And then when it was done, they would just unwrap it and uh, put it uh, right on top of a bowl. So like the fish wasn't attached or anything. Like you'd still be looking at the fish. Uh, While well, the fish was looking right back at you. <laughs> um, so you basically go in with your right hand and kind of mix and match whatever looked appetizing to you and mix it in with some rice. And uh, that's, that's how it was done over there. Uh, the music was the last part to happen during the evening, both at weddings and naming ceremonies. And it was sort of like the after party. So we'd go late into the night. Unlike the actual ceremony during the day, you did not have to have an invite from the host family to come witness the music. So if you heard it from a ways away, uh, you could come into the family's home and they would welcome you in uh, to the event to, to listen to the music. Sometimes the chorus would be featured as uh, the lead instrument of a band with electric guitars, electric bass guitar, drum sets, like a regular drum kit that you'd see in a jazz band or a rock band. Uh, synthesizer style keyboards even, and they'd all be plugged into a, a large sound system, which uh, would channel in two huge amplifiers. And so the, the sound would carry quite a ways. It seemed like on weekends, uh, from my teacher's compound, if I were just to sit there, I could hear a good 10 to 15 different concerts going on at once, outdoor concerts uh, like this. Um, the bands who played at them, they made their living doing this. And so they had to engage the audience to, to get paid. And so uh, we're kind of going back to the whole concept here now of the sound hole being used as a money hole. So there'd be a lot of praise singing that would take place. So I'm going to give you an example of what this would look like and why it happens. So let's just imagine that the, the, uh, 
the the name of the, the song they're singing is called Frank Jones. So when the core player eventually starts singing, he may be singing something in essence of um, anyone from Frank Jones' family. Back in the year 1612, uh, here are these four things that Frank did for your people that were so important. And I'm going to talk about this for the next little bit. So if any of you out there are in this, this lineage in the Jones family, please come up and show your respect in the form of a cash payment. So the reason that this type of monetary exchange takes place is because the people really value the fact that the griots are the safekeepers of their history, knowing 800 years worth. And um, the fact that a griot can ask your last name and be able to tell you about your family dating back 800 years means a great deal to the people. And so they want to see that the griots are um, financially compensated for the work that they're doing as safekeepers. So. I'm going to play a song next called Alake. And then after that, um, we're going to go ahead and have a little Q&A session and then move on to the last song for the evening. And um, so if you do have any questions, uh, go ahead and type them into the chat feature. And I'm actually going to move closer and uh, look into the chat screen. And I'll go ahead and answer your questions uh, one at a time. Uh, this one's called Alalake, and it's a 300-year-old song. Uh, basically meaning when good work has been done, uh, those who are responsible, they should be celebrated or rewarded. Alalake. <laughs> So 
actually, before we go ahead and launch into the Q and A, um, there's one more little bit I would like to tell you about, and that's how I got interested in all of this. Um, so I, I came across the Quora in 2006, and I literally stumbled across the Quora at a live performance because my dad invited me to a local folk music festival uh, in my hometown of Olympia, Washington, uh, which is where I lived for most of my life before moving here to Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where I'm now based. And so the person that I heard perform that night, uh, his name is Kane Mathis, and he was born and raised in the States, just like myself. And he's been to the Gambia a fair amount of times as well. So I talked with him after the show, and I figured out that he was willing to teach me. And so I was able to acquire a Quora uh, shortly after from a guy who had just gone to Gambia and come back. And I started taking lessons with Kane. Uh, I was going up to his place in Seattle uh, once every, oh, two months or so uh, for about a year and a half. And so he would teach me some of the traditional songs. And then in January 2008 is when I took my first of the three trips to the Gambia. Uh, so the trip in 2008 was for three and a half months. And I was a student uh, at Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. So I was receiving um, music credit to be there, music performance credit and ethnomusicology. And, uh, so, and in 2012, I went back for six weeks and more recently in 2018, I was there for five. And the two teachers that I worked with while I was there were the same teachers that Kane, my American teacher, had worked with. So he put me in touch with them. And their names are Moriba Kuyate. And he's the adopted son of the late Malamini Jabate, uh, who passed away about a year after my second visit. And Morba and Malamini, uh, not only did they uh, teach me how to play Quora between, I would say, two and eight hours a day, combined between the two of them, they really took care of me like I was family. And uh, I mean, from the, the initial phone call to uh, picking me up at the airport and taking me home and, and feeding me. Uh, they really, they really did take care of me well, and so um, I owe them a great deal for, for being able to share all of this with you. And so uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, um, go ahead and go into your chat feature, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, see if I can answer them here one at a time. Uh, so if you're looking at a a Zoom, if you're looking at your Zoom screen, I'm actually on an Android here. I believe there's a, a button that says more on the bottom right. And once you hit that, um, there should be a, a chat button there. Um, and so I'm seeing a question from Carolyn. Yes. And it yeah. says. Yes, yeah, Sean. Carolyn actually has a few questions already. And okay. I'll say one after another. Okay. Um, what kind of gourd was used for the Quora he is playing now? So the one that I just played. Um, that was a little while used... back in the program. What? Sorry? That was a little while back in the program, but she had asked what kind of gourd was used for the Quora. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll bring it back up here in the forefront. So with the wood for this traditional Quora right here from Gambia uh, is uh, what's called Kano. K-E-N-O. Um, it's a wood that's pretty much only found in uh, various parts of Africa. Um, and then with the, the non-traditional one with the tuning pegs, it uses a combination of paduk, which is a Southern African hardwood, and also Honduras mahogany. Uh, another question was, what's the significance of the you have like a painting or a quilt behind you. Is there a significance to that? Yes, there actually is uh, behind this, um, this tie-dyed sheet back here. Um, it's actually a bed sheet, believe it or not, and I got it in Gambia. And so when I was setting up the, the spare bedroom of my apartment as a, um, a live performance recording studio, I decided to hang it. And yes, her third question was, were you living in... Were you living in Banjul? I was not. I was living in Brikama, which is a little further south of that. So Banjul is the capital of Gambia. Um, 
and Bricama is the second largest city, um, just a little ways to the south of there. So. You know what, uh, Sean, I'm going to unmute everyone just in case they're unfamiliar with uh, their chat feature or um, just allow them a chance to ask a sure. question personally. Is that okay? Sure, you may get, we're probably going to get some feedback. Um, I had digital feedback when we did this in my last program, but we can go ahead and give it a try. Okay. Uh, otherwise, everybody, if you know where your chat is and know how to type a question, definitely go ahead. We'll make sure to uh, um, address them all, but I am going to unmute just in case. Okay. Okay. So now everyone, you should just be able to speak into, uh, speak in a, up and you'll be able to answer, ask a question. Uh, Sean, this is Carolyn. Um, the Hi, Carolyn. I had asked you about the one that was made in the US. What kind of cord was used? So it's, it's a combination of Paduk and Honduras mahogany. That's the gourd itself. Oh, the gourd is actually a calabash. So a calabash is a gourd that's in the same family as the pumpkin. Right, but I thought that's what you said was used for the one made in Africa. True, both. Actually, both use a calabash. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, here's one. How do you travel? <laughs> it's a good one. How do you travel with the instrument? Um, so I actually only have one case. It's a fiberglass hard shell case. And I put the, the American made Cora in there just because it's more delicate with the tuning pegs. Um, so it gets protected pretty well. It's, it's a very large case. Um, and so I can check the, the Cora on uh, like an airplane just as checked baggage. So, but I don't have a, a case for the, the traditional one. So if I'm, if I'm ever flying, I just take one Cora. But for like most of my performing, I just drive. And so I'll, I'll load both in to the car. Any other questions? OK. All right. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up with, uh, with one more song. Um, and this one is actually one that I wrote myself. Uh, it's called Smoky Mountain Sunset, and I wrote this after a backpacking trip into the Great Smoky Mountains uh, about four years ago, and there was a gorgeous sunset that night, and so that's what inspired me to write this song. <laughs> Thank you. 
so much for coming out tonight. Um, hope you enjoyed the program. I uh, hope you like you uh, learned something in the process. Um, hope you all are well and healthy and um, yeah, I wish you all the best during these very challenging times. So thank you all so much for this opportunity. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yes, Sean, I cannot thank you for enough. This was a wonderful, wonderful program. I think it was so enjoyable for a night like tonight. And um, to everybody out there, stay with us on our virtual programs. Uh, we are sad to inform everybody that all of our summer programs will be virtual. None will be in the library. But we hope to see you all soon in one way or another. And uh, we'll keep in touch with you all. Until then, you know, just keep in touch with us. You saw that Sean did a wonderful job on on this platform and we hope to continue that. So thank you and have a great night, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Sean.